chapter on electrochemistry is going to start with a look at the battery. The battery has come a long way since this early model, but let's talk about the components of this first battery to help us understand what's going on with the batteries in our phones and in our laptops. This battery in this image is also referred to as a voltaic pile. The voltaic pile is named after Alessandro Volta. The unit of volts are also named after Alessandro Volta. Now what Volta did is he took advantage of some electrochemical cells, some redox reactions. The key is that the oxidation and reduction were separated though into two different regions of his battery, of his electrochemical cell. By separating the oxidation from reduction, you can allow electrons to transfer and you can control the transfer of electrons through a conductive material or a wire. This flow of electrons through a wire is an electric current. And so a battery is a great way to store electricity and allow a current to be released across a wire. Now there are two types of electrochemical cells that we're going to consider in this chapter. The voltaic cell, the one that we looked at the previous picture, also called a galvanic cell. These reactions are spontaneous. They release energy. Electrolytic cells are non-spontaneous. They require energy to be put in in order to proceed. So let's start with Volta's voltaic pile, his first battery. What Volta did is he alternated areas of oxidation and reduction. So each of those little disks that you see here is an area of oxidation or an area of reduction. He used zinc and silver plates and stacked them one on top of the other. Zinc, we know, is a really reactive metal. Well, when metals react, they tend to lose electrons. That is the definition of oxidation. Silver, however, is one of our noble metals. It does not want to oxidize. So silver is the site of reduction. The other thing that Volta came upon was he separated these disks of zinc and silver by having these little plaster wafers in between them. And he soaked those plaster wafers in brine, which is a saturated salt water solution. And I'll show you why that's important in a moment. Instead of looking at a more complicated voltaic cell like this, Let's look at a simpler system where we just have one oxidation cell and one reduction cell. Here's an image from our text. You can see we have an area labeled an anode and an area labeled a cathode. We have zinc metal stuck in a solution of zinc sulfate. And we have hydrogen gas which is trapped in a solution of hydrochloric acid. We're connecting the two electrodes, we're connecting the anode and the cathode together with a wire, and they have a picture of a voltmeter actually measuring how much electric potential, how much voltage is being created here. We have two electrodes. We have the anode, and the anode is the place where oxidation is occurring. This is the place where electrons are being released. And we have the cathode. The cathode is where reduction is occurring. This is where electrons are being absorbed. So if you look at the diagram from the text, you can see that electrons are leaving the zinc, that is your anode, and electrons are going into your hydrogen, that is the cathode. You have a wire connecting the two electrodes, which allows the flow of electrons, otherwise you can't have oxidation or reduction. And the electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode. They always flow from oxidation to reduction. And then we have a salt bridge. Now the salt bridge isn't very clearly labeled here, but that's the section in the middle between the two flasks. As you can imagine, as electrons leave one of the flasks and go to the other, your charge is going to get unbalanced. Your anode is going to get more and more positive as it loses electrons, and your cathode is going to get more and more negative as you gain electrons. What will eventually happen is that your concentrations will get so out of whack, and your charges will get so out of whack, that the reaction will stop. If the cathode gets too negative, then electrons won't flow to it. Electrons will be repelled from it. And if the anode gets too positive, well then that's going to start attracting electrons. So your battery won't work anymore. The salt bridge allows the ions in the two flasks to flow back and forth between them. Most notably, it will allow the negative ions to flow from the cathode to the anode. The salt bridge is often used with a common ion between the anode and the cathode. Unfortunately, this example from the text, we have different ions in the two solutions. We have sulfate ions in one and chloride ions in the other, so there is no common ion. 
but often when you see these voltaic cells, you'll see a common ion connecting the anode and the cathode through the salt bridge. A chart you're going to be using a lot in this chapter is a chart of standard reduction potentials. As you look at this chart more closely, you'll see that all of these half reactions that are listed, they're all reduction reactions. Every single one of these reactions, you're seeing a gain of electrons. What this chart is showing you is which elements reduce the best and which elements are really bad at producing. So you have fluorine, which is really eager to gain electrons, and we've talked about that all year. We've talked about electron affinity and electronegativity. Fluorine is really eagerly gaining electrons, and so it is at the top of your reduction potential. Lithium, a very reactive metal, doesn't want to gain electrons, it wants to lose electrons, so it's at the very bottom of your reduction potential. The reduction potentials also tell you exactly how much voltage or how much electric potential is either released or absorbed when one of these half reactions proceeds. We'll get to that in a little bit. Before we get into using this table, let's make sure we're okay with some of the symbology here. We're going to be measuring cell potentials. It's how much potential energy is stored by one of these reduction or oxidation reactions electric potential energy. So it's not going to be measured in joules, it's going to be measured in voltage. So we can say the terms electric potential, voltage, and volts, they're all synonymous, with volts being the correct unit. The chart that we looked at are standard electric potentials. This is very similar to saying like a standard change in enthalpy or a standard change in entropy. So that table on page 845, you'll see this symbol, this epsilon naught. And that is your standard electric potential. Just like standard enthalpy and standard entropy, one atmosphere is a standard pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, or 298 Kelvin is standard temperature. One that's a little bit different is that a lot of these reactions occur in the presence of an aqueous solution, so the concentration of those solutions will be important. So the standard concentration used in that chart is one molar. So if you're going to be following that chart, the solutions you're using must be one molar solutions. Before we get into the actual numbers and the standard potentials, the chart can be used as a measure of how reactive metals are. When we talk about metals being reactive, we talk about the ability of a metal to oxidize, the ability for a metal to lose electrons. This table ranks the ability of elements to gain electrons. The reduction potentials are kind of the opposite of an activity series for metals. So your most reactive metals will be at the bottom of this table. Your least reactive metals will be near the top. Early in the year, we looked at this reaction. I asked what would happen if a piece of silver metal is placed in the solution of aluminum nitrate. Well, the setup is for a single replacement reaction. The setup is for silver to try and replace aluminum within the aluminum nitrate. But if you look at our reduction potentials, you'll see that aluminum is pretty low. It's in the lower right hand corner of this. And silver is much higher. It's one of the least reactive metals, as we've already said today. So aluminum is more reactive than silver. Or another way to say this is that silver is less reactive than aluminum. So if we were to look at this reaction, silver is not reactive enough to replace the aluminum. Let's finish up by looking at the values of those standard potentials. Let's see if we can calculate the voltage we would expect a voltaic cell to produce. I'm going to make a voltaic cell constructed with copper and zinc electrodes under standard conditions. I want to know several things. I want to know which metal is the anode and which metal is the cathode and how much voltage will be produced if we make this cell under standard conditions. We're going to have to use this chart to answer the question. We're told that this is a voltaic cell, which means that this process is happening spontaneously. If this is happening spontaneously, that means that the metal that wants to oxidize is oxidizing, and the metal that wants to reduce is reducing. So let's take a look at our two metals. I've got copper, and I've got zinc. Our experience in the lab tells us that zinc is a pretty reactive metal. We've used it a lot this year, and copper is not very reactive. We needed to put it in nitric acid to get anything to happen. So intuitively, I think we would see that zinc is more reactive than copper. But if we take a look at the reduction potentials, let's take a look. Let's see if we can find zinc. All right, so here's zinc right here. And to find the copper, 
Well, copper has different forms. We have copper that can go to 2 plus to 1 plus, copper from 1 plus to neutral. The most common form of copper, it doesn't say it explicitly in the question, but the most common form of copper is the copper 2 plus, and we're using elemental form of copper. So as you can see from the table, zinc is much lower on the reduction potential than copper. So zinc rather oxidize and copper rather reduce, which is precisely what we said. Zinc is more reactive than copper. If we know that zinc rather oxidize, that means zinc is deanode. So zinc is going to oxidize and go from a Zn neutral to a Zn2 plus and give off two electrons. That's oxidation, and that's our anode. The copper is going to reduce. It's going to go from copper 2 plus to neutral copper, which means that the copper is going to gain two electrons. So that's our cathode. Another way to show this is something that the text uses. They use a line notation. They take the two cells and they do the oxidation to zinc neutral and separate it with a line going to zinc 2 plus. And then they separate the oxidation cell from the reduction cell with two lines and show the reduction, copper 2 plus, going to copper. So you'll see this line notation in the text as well. Well, if we want to find the total voltage, we need to find the voltages of these individual cells. So the copper is going from 2 plus to neutral, and so our standard cell potential is 0.34 volts. So we could say that for the copper, this E naught is 0 0.34 volts. For the zinc, I have a value of reduction of negative 0 0.76. But the zinc isn't reducing, it's oxidizing. So we've taken this reaction and flipped it. So much in the way we did when we worked with Hess's law, if we are going to flip the reaction, we should flip the potential. So the E naught here is going to be positive 0 0.76 volts. So that means that E total, under standard conditions, is going to be 0.76 plus 0.34, which is going to be 1.10 volts. And I like that this is positive. It means that voltage is being given off. So that tells us that this is a spontaneous process. It's producing voltage.